another lecture and we're going to kind of leave the molecular and biochemical focused lectures and we're going to start moving into metabolism which is a very very important uh, topic for us especially uh, being sports scientists being exercise physiologists uh, we have to understand bioenergetics and how energy is made uh, within the cellular environment in order to basically produce energy and the energy that we are trying to produce um, with uh, athletes or people who are exercising is of course I'm just readjusting this is of course ATP right so that is the energy currency of almost every reaction in the cell so ATP uh, much like a savings account we want to put in as much uh, ATP pools and what I mean by pools is just areas in the body where we can store ATP we want to put as much uh, ATP in those pools as we can and then we want to have a system of enzymatic reactions uh, that occur that will help us essentially create ATP when there's a demand placed on the body such as exercise so the the basically the final goal of metabolism which is what we're talking now is to essentially create energy from a foodstuff and foodstuff is what we eat right and we want to have a continuous supply of energy to an organism or which is us as a human body uh, in order to basically produce that energy during exercise so let's uh, look at the next slide here and I'm just basically going to show you guys where this information is coming from this is from the uh, biochemistry for medical students this is going to have two parts we're going to do an introduction to metabolism which is what I'm talking about now that's on page 83 chapter 8 and then the chemistry of carbohydrates which is page 60 uh, chapter 6 in the exact same book and um, I'm going to uh, oops, sorry about that I'm gonna like tailor this a little bit so that uh, we're not getting too much into the chemical shapes and the chemical structures and and all of that so um, let's talk a bit about what metabolism is and metabolism consists of a series of reaction that occur within a cell of, of, of an organism and, and basically these reactions uh, aid in sustaining life so the process of metabolism basically involves many interconnected cellular pathways and that's something that you really have to think about for this is we have thousands of reactions that are taking place within the cell at any given time these are well coordinated and they're purposeful and these reactions are called metabolism so again these are interconnected cellular pathways and that's going to make sense when we talk about uh, glycolysis uh, and aerobic and anaerobic glycolysis and then we move into aerobic uh, production of energy or uh, we can call that beta uh, oxidation or um, we talk about the electron transport chain and the citric acid cycle these are all connected they're all interconnected with one another and they help us make energy um, so metabolism is organized into distinct metabolic pathways to either maximize and capture the energy or to minimize the use of energy when we are in a basal condition and basal condition means when when we are resting okay and the basic principles of this energy consumption and energy production uh, are what we're going to talk about because that's what metabolism is it's it's this well coordinated and purposeful process of either making energy and storing it or breaking energy down and using it okay so we know that chemical energy is obtained from how when we get food right these energy rich nutrients right you eat a horrible diet filled with saturated fats you're going to get horrible energy right you get a diet that is balanced and has the right uh, amount of protein complex carbohydrates and fatty acids you're going to produce a lot of 
uh, favorable energy. So we know that the food that we consume is conserved, is converted into these building blocks uh, called cellular macromolecules, right? Which is kind of what we talked about in lecture one and two, right? Micromolecules and macromolecules. You guys should be familiar with this. That's why I'm bringing this back. And I'm even going to I'm even going to make that bold just to help you remember from lecture one and lecture two when we first started this semester we were talking about micro and macro molecules well now they're back um, and these macro molecules basically help us make things such as proteins and nucleic acids and polysaccharides so we talked about proteins right we know that these micro molecules which are amino acids and nucleic acids they can form together to make macromolecules, which would be in this case DNA, or in this case, we would take amino acids and turn those into proteins, right? The same thing can happen with sugar. We can take glucose and we can string glucose together to make polysaccharides such as glycogen. And if you don't know what glycogen is, glycogen is a stored source of carbohydrates that we store in the liver and we store in the muscle to utilize when we need ATP. So again, we have micromolecules that can come together to form macromolecules. And these macromolecules are purposeful for physiology and especially with the performance in sports. Um, so we're kind of revisiting that again. And um, these metabolic pathways are taking place with the help of sequential enzyme systems. And I will talk to you guys more about that in a moment. Okay. So think about sequential enzymatic systems. And I put it here one more time just to beat a dead horse. Okay. Um, and we have regulators of the sequential enzymatic systems okay and and these regulators are sensitive to energy so if we have a lot of energy in the cell and let's say we're just talking about a muscle cell there's a lot of energy there these enzymes will slow down they're sensitive to the energy right there's no need to accelerate their reactions to create more energy when the muscle cell is satisfied with the amount of energy that is currently in there. So we have lots of regulators that make sure we're producing enough energy, but not overproducing. And we're also, uh, when we start to utilize energy, these enzymes are also sensitive to low energy conditions. And when we have low energy conditions, they might rev up their activity so that they can produce energy um, they can produce energy more favorably uh, with the demands of exercise. So regulation of energy use, whether energy is being used or stored, is uh, regulated through allosteric enzymes. Okay, and allosteric enzymes, again, which I just said here, they will increase or decrease their activity under the influence of effector molecules. And what I mean by effector molecules is just glucose, fatty acids, ATP, ADP, AMP, these, these enzymes are sensitive to all of these things. So if we're, um, if we're in a state where we have a low amount of energy in the muscular cell, uh, these allosteric enzymes will recognize that and they will, let's say, increase their activity to help bring in more sugar, which is an effector molecule, right? To help break that sugar down into ATP in real time so that you can, can you can continue to exercise now another regulator that will regulate this process of metabolism is hormonal regulation so hormones are going to be secreted we know that they are chemical messengers and we have many different endocrine secreting glands in the body and essentially the endocrine signal will tell the body whether it's going to store energy or release energy right we have different signals so let's just use an example right now if we have the hormone of insulin being secreted from the pancreas that is going to tell the body to store energy and to build energy that is a growth hormone now if we think about the opposite of insulin we have glucagon and glucagon is a hormone that is secreted that tells the body to start breaking down stored energy. And, and ironically, it's the stored energy that insulin had, had previously stored. So we have hormonal regulation as well. We have enzymes that will either help build or break down energy. And then we also have DNA regulation, which means that the concentration of these enzymes 
and the concentration of these hormones can be altered specifically with exercise where we produce more of them. We can have a higher concentration of them and that is something that we uh, will establish when we are exercising chronically, right? That's what allows you to exercise. If you're if you're somebody that's exercising with friends and you can outlast them in, in time that you're in the gym or you can run farther or faster than them and you are, quote, in better shape, in quotes, well, that means that all of these things are regulating your use of energy better than your friend is regulating their use of energy. So, um, so now what we're going to do is we're going to talk about three basic types of metabolic pathways. And these are things that you've probably seen before, but we're going to discuss them anyways to be thorough. We're going to talk about catabolic reactions, anabolic reactions, and amphibolic reactions. Okay. Catabolic means to break down. This is a degradation pathway, right? So if we have ATP and ATP is being used, uh, we need that energy to exercise. Well, that ATP will be broken down into ADP, right? So adenosine diphosphate. And if we're still exercising very intensely, well, then that ADP will get broken down into AMP, which is adenosine monophosphate. And that's what happens in a catabolic reaction. And these catabolic reactions are regulated through use of enzymes and use of hormones. That's what tells the body to break things down. Now, on the other side, we have an anabolic reaction, and this is a biosynthesis pathway. This is telling us to build. This is where energy, potential energy, is packed and stored. And just to give you an example of what an anabolic reaction would be, is if we are in a low energy state, like we just exercised, right? We have a lot of AMP floating around in the cellular environment. And then we go and drink our protein shake and we get our calories in. Well, that endogenous, uh, those endogenous calories and the food stuff that is coming in is going to help us rebuild AMP to ADP and then ultimately restore ATP concentrations, right? So we have purely catabolic, we have purely anabolic, and then we have this one, which is a biochemical pathway that includes both. And this is more true to physiology than anything else, okay? So again, if we have a catabolic reaction, this is the metabolic breakdown of complex molecules into simpler ones, right? So we're going from macromolecules to micromolecules, if you want to use that language that we used before. If we have an anabolic reaction, we have the phases of the metabol metabolism in which complex molecules are made. And these complex molecules can be proteins, they can be fats, they can be body tissues, right? Uh, and we can also break down those same complex molecules in a catabolic reaction. We can have proteins broken down, we can have fatty acids broken down, we can have body tissue broken down, especially if you're in a state of starvation. Um, and then we can have this type of reaction, which is both of them occurring simultaneously together. Now on this slide, we can see a really cool example of this amphibolic reaction, right? And we know that this here is a process in which anabolic and catabolic reactions are occurring the exact same time. And this is in the TCA cycle or the citric acid cycle. And if you're not familiar with this, you will be as we get more into metabolism, but this is the citric acid cycle and this is occurring within the mitochondria. Uh, and just, you know, basically your type 1 muscle fibers are very dense with mitochondria, so you have a lot of energy production being uh, produced uh, in the mitochondria while also using fatty acids to help with that. So there's a catabolic and an anabolic component to this. So the catabolic part is the oxidation or the breaking down of this acetyl-CoA, which I'll, it's right here. So this acetyl-CoA is a mediator that can come from uh, either fatty acids or from a sugar, which in this case is a pyruvate. So if we have sugar being utilized during exercise, sugar can have two fates. One fate, it can go this way where it is being used in an anaerobic fashion, or if the exercise intensity is low enough, uh, this sugar can get converted into pyruvate and pyruvate can go into the citric acid cycle. So now this acetyl-CoA, it's going to be uh, basically broken down 
to help release some energy, okay? And this acetyl-CoA can come from either carbohydrates, fats, or proteins to be used as energy. Now, there's also some energy that is being created in the citric acid cycle. We'll have some ATP uh, or some GTP. So I'm just going to put ATP down like that. We'll have some Na. Oh my gosh, I'm trying to draw with my right hand. Sorry about that. NADH and FA. D, I'm going to be ambidextrous by the time I'm done with this class. H2, right? Um, you'll get these other products being produced in the citric acid cycle, which will go to the electron transport chain and help to generate energy. And if you don't know what any of these things are right now, do not worry. We will, we will, we will get you there, okay? So just understand that when we get into the citric acid cycle, which is what you see here, there are, let's go back to this one slide really quick. There's lots of enzymes here that are making reactions happen. So we'll go back here. What did I say about enzymes? Lots of enzymes making reactions happen. Okay, that's what all these things are here. All right. There are also hormones involved. Let's go here. Hormones. Well, when you're exercising, you're going to have some cortisol released. You're going to have some glucagon released. You're going to have some catecholamines like epinephrine and norepinephrine released. And you're going to start having a decrease in ATP because you're using it. You're using ATP. So all these things are going to play a role in basically secreting or, or recruiting fatty acids, right? You can see fatty acids here to come into the muscle cell and to be converted into ATP, right? Uh, and all of these processes are happening just like I explained here. We have enzymes working together and these enzymes are working in a sequential manner, right? So look at here. doesn't matter whose mitochondria you look at. This is the sequence of reactions in the citric acid cycle. It doesn't change. It's a sequence of reactions. We go back here. I told you it's a sequence of enzyme systems or a sequence of reactions. We also know that if fatty acids are coming into the mitochondria, we know if glucose is coming into the mitochondria, that we have hormone secretion that is telling the body to secrete those things so that we can get the right fuel to the right place at the right time. Okay, so this is something we call cellular respiration and cellular respiration is both making and breaking energy. So I'm just introducing that concept to you right now. By no means at this at this uh, at this point in the game do you guys have to memorize these reactions. Just understand that we have catabolic, we have anabolic, and we have both. And one of the places where we have the making and the breaking of energy is in the mitochondria via cellular respiration. Okay. Um, and that is all I have to say about that. So let's move on to the basics of the degradation of breaking down food stuff that we bring in from the body because this is what drives metabolism. So when we talk about eating food, we're talking about masticating, right? We're, we're chewing food and that food is masticated and, it's, and it basically is combined with chemical and mechanical properties that will help break down the food both in the mouth and in the gut. And we'll use a variety of different enzymes to do this. We'll use enzymes, we'll use acids, we'll use mechanical energy, all to break down this stuff right here, right? So if we were to have this piece of bread right here and we, let me draw a mouth, we put it in our mouth, right? It's wide open. And let's just say because it's Halloween or we're kind of close to Halloween, this guy has fangs and he is a vampire who likes bread. Okay. Um, he takes a piece of bread and he puts it in his mouth. And if that vampire was not to chew that bread at all, there would be enzymes in the mouth that would start breaking down the bread. And we call that enzyme amylase. And basically amylase attacks simple sugars. So if this were white bread, the amylase would work faster. And that amylase would be broken down into kind of like a, a porridge in your mouth, right? The amylase would break down the bread. Uh, we would also use our teeth to help break down that bread. And then we would swallow the bread and the bread would move through the esophagus through a process called peristalsis. 
um, and then it would move into the lower esophageal sphincter and go into the gut where inside of the gut we would have mechanical churning if it were protein if we put the protein in there and we put the cheese in there we would have the release of pepsin and pepsinogen which would help break apart all of those uh, bonds uh, so if we bring in a piece of steak we know that steak is a protein so a steak is going to have all these amino acids right i'm just drawing these amino acids all folded together into complex proteins well we have um we have enzymes in our stomach called pepsin that will break all of those bonds and also what else do we have in our stomach we have acid right and i told you oops sorry i'm trying to erase this i told you in the last slides that we were talking about is that protein is sensitive to acid and if we have acid protein will go back into its what its primary structure right so now we're bringing that back into it and our primary structure is linear right so if we have acids that are going to denature the protein and make that protein linear and then we have these enzymes called pepsin they will break down those bonds and then we will have amino acids in the stomach rather than this big protein right so i'm just trying to tie all these things together for you guys um and breaking down this food is going to be a combination of those chemicals of those acids and of those enzymes and of mechanical churning they're all going to break those things down because we have to absorb these nutrients into the small intestines in a very specific type of way um, so we will have primary metabolism which is where the gi tract converts these macromolecules again what is a macromolecule it is that big complex protein right if we brought in steak steak is a whole bunch of complex proteins in tertiary and quaternary structures just kind of bound together right so if this is that steak protein we want to convert that macromolecule into smaller units which would be the amino acids right and we do that through chewing we do that through pepsin we do that through pepsinogen and we do that through the acid because the pH in your gut is a pH of two or three which is highly acidic which means this complex protein is going to be linear because that acidity will break all the bonds that holds the protein in this structure right then we have secondary or intermediate metabolary metabolism sorry and this is where the products are absorbed and they're broken down to smaller components as well and ultimately these will be oxidized into co2 and we will also have some reducing equivalents called nadh or fadh so what happens is when we get glucose or protein or fatty acids and we consume it and we break it down and we deliver it into the blood well then those basic components can be used to produce other sources of energy which are these guys here and i just drew that for you on the last slide over here i was telling you about fadh and nadh so i'm just introducing these concepts to you right now so don't don't get overwhelmed okay this would be let's just think of it as our primary metabolism is what happens when food comes into the mouth goes into the gut and gets broken down our secondary metabolism well this is the metabolism of these products but on a cellular level so which means they're going to give us more energy after we consume them and put them in our body and that energy is going to come in the form of atp and these nadh and fadh and we'll we'll talk about that and then we have this tertiary metabolism where these products here will move into the mitochondria and in the electron chain they will produce more atp right and i'm not going to draw that because it's looking pretty bad on my right hand right now okay so we have this primary metabolism which is whole foods whole foods being consumed and broken down into these constituents here which could be amino acids or glucose molecules or fatty acids and then those fatty acids those glucose molecules or those amino acids will get broken down further into these um, molecules here which are electron carriers and we'll talk about these more in detail for right now i just need you to say okay nadh and fadh it's a currency it's a type of currency that i can spend in the electron transport chain to help create more energy okay 
So we have primary, secondary, and we have tertiary metabolism. And if we had a microscope, we would just be zooming in, zooming in, zooming in, right? This would be the steak. Zoom in. That will give us amino acids. If we metabolize uh, more amino acids or more sugars, we'll zoom in again and we'll get these electron carriers, right? And these electron carriers, if we zoom in again, these will go into the mitochondria and they'll interact with the electron transport chain and they will give us ultimately more energy. All right, that's the takeaway there. Let me clean this up so you guys don't have that on your slide and then we will move on. So let's put this together um, just in case it was a bit confusing on the last slide. So again, we're going to look at this. Let's just right now look at primary and secondary metabolism, okay? And let's really focus on these products here, right? NADH and FADH. Now, these two things are called electron carriers or reducing equivalents. So I want you to write down in that in your notes. These are either noted as electron carriers or reducing equivalents. So I hope you wrote that down. Okay, so let's look at, let's say we are going to eat some grapes and some bread. Okay, so we have these polymers, right? We have, if we have grapes, we have these very complex food stuff that are made up of amino acids and carbohydrates, right? And we want to get them into the body. So that means we have to break down these complex structures and let them into the body through the small intestines. And, and that takes a, a bit of energy to do that, right? So what happens is we break down the grapes and we start to utilize our, our teeth. We start to utilize enzymes to help break down the sugars. And what happens is we get these glucose molecules that will get into the small intestines and they will cross the small intestines. Follow my, follow my little dots here. And they will get into the bloodstream. Okay. So we had, uh, let's say that with these grapes, we had some complex chains of carbohydrates kind of all bound together, right? So these are all, these are all different sugars. They could be fructose, glucose, sucrose, right? All these different types of sugars, mostly fructose because we're talking about fruits, right? And we have this polymer, right? We have this complex chain of sugars. And that's why when we eat grapes, they taste sweet because there's a lot of sugar in there, okay? So now we start to chew that food. We start to break it down. And what happens is through the mouth, through the teeth, through the mastication, through the uh, gut churning and releasing enzymes, we break down that polymer into individual sugars, okay, which are called, um, well, we can break them down into individuals or we can break them down into two or three sugar molecules, right? So we, they can go through as a monosaccharide, a disaccharide, or a trisaccharide. Now that is the only way sugar can get past the um, small intestines and into the bloodstream, right? So we're going to have this polymer broken down into mono, di, or trisaccharides, right? It just means sugar. And they can pass through the gut into the bloodstream. Now, once that sugar gets into the bloodstream, let's say we're exercising and we need to use that sugar. Well, that sugar is then going to go to contracting skeletal muscle and it's going to enter something called glycolysis, right? Here it is. Now let's go back really quick. We are talking about primary metabolism. And then once we get to the cellular level, we're going to start talking about secondary metabolism. And remember what I said here, a sequential enzyme system that will break things down, right? Uh, so I go back here and we are looking at a sequence of enzymes. That's what glycolysis is. It is a sequence of enzymes breaking down glucose to do what? Well, you can see here it's creating energy. ATP. You can see here that it's creating energy, ATP. 
So if we're creating energy, there is a bit of an anabolic reaction here because we're creating ATP. And let me see if I can zoom in. What we are creating ATP from is ADP, right? We're using broken down energy to regenerate new energy. This part is anab anabolic. This part is anabolic. You can see here, it's, sorry, it's so blurry. That's an ADP. ADP is being converted into ATP. So we have energy. So does that mean glycolysis is a 100% anabolic process? No, because there is an investment phase in, in glycolysis, which means it's going to take some energy. So what is what is our uh, what is our where's that slide at? Let me find it. Here it is. It is also catabolic. It's going to take some energy. So if we go back to glycolysis here, we look at the first stage. Let me clean this up. We look at the first stage of glycolysis and we can see that ATP is being converted into ADP right there. So there is an investment phase where catabolism is happening. Here is catabolism. Here is anabolism. We have the, we have the creation of energy. So glycolysis we could theoretically say is what? And I'm just going to put that right there. It is a biochemical pathway that includes both anabolic and catabolic processes. Oh, okay. I get it. Hopefully you see that now. Now, not only are we producing and using ATP in glycolysis that we got from the sugars that had to be broken down from a macromolecule to micromolecules, to get past the small intestines and to get into the bloodstream. But now we're going to talk about the secondary metabolism, right? So if we look here, let's go back one more time. Let's just beat a dead horse. Secondary or intermediate metabolism. We should see the generation of these reducing equivalents or these electron carriers. Well, let's go back and see if they're there. Uh, look at what I see right here. And I, I know it's blurry. I apologize. Right there is an NADH that is being made. Um, and there should be, let's see if there's another one. Let me see if I can zoom in and find it. It might be a bit too blurry. Okay, I'm not seeing it, but that's okay. We know that there is secondary metabolism that is occurring because we are getting the generation of NADH, which is a reducing equivalent. And we know that this electron carrier is going to go into the mitochondria. Let me just draw a mitochondria here. That's my best mitochondria with my right hand. It's going to interact with the electron transport chain, which would be our, let's go back and look. Uh, where is it at? Let me find it. Our tertiary metabolism, electron transport chain. We know that that NADH that was produced in glycolysis will go here, interact with the electron transport chain, and ultimately be converted into ATP. All right, so we have primary, secondary, secondary, tertiary. Okay, I hope that makes sense. And if you need to see what NADH does, we can look here. Here we have the electron transport chain as noted there. And look at what came into the mitochondria to supply energy. And I told you there's also FADH and there's FADH as well. So that would be our tertiary metabolism. And look at what is being produced. Where is it at? Let me find right there. ADP is being turned into ATP with the assistance of this electron carrier and this electron carrier, or this reducing equivalent, or this reducing equivalent. And where do these come from? They came from metabolic pathways that had sequential enzyme systems, such as glycolysis and the uh, TCA cycle, right? the citric acid cycle. So I'm just introducing these to you guys now. And if you guys want, I can, I can draw a picture that puts all this together. But right now, I'm just introducing some concepts to you so you have a foundation. You have a basis to further talk about these things. Okay, so when we're talking about metabolism, we're talking about basically bioenergetics. We bring in food, right? 
food has to be broken down so it can get into the small intestines. Once it's in the small intestines, it will go into the bloodstream. That bloodstream will carry it to different organs. It could be the liver, could be fat cells, could be skeletal muscle, could be could be neurons that require glucose, could be any system in the body. But once that once that compound, once that molecule gets there, that energy producing molecule, it's going to have to go through a sequence of enzymatic reactions to get broken down into ATP or generate these electron carriers, which are NADH or FADH2. So let's transition now to what the energy requirements are uh, at rest uh, during exercise and then what energy looks like when we're in a fed and we're in a fasted state. So first let's talk about some of the major differences between bioenergetics at rest and during exercise. So we know that ATP is the most important molecule to sustain life with, within the body, right? Um, it is referred to as this molecular unit of currency because it basically powers every metabolic process that we have in our body. So most ATP is produced in the mitochondria through a series of reactions. And these reactions are known as the citric acid cycle or the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain. Okay, so let's go back to what we talked about before. We have anabolic and catabolic reactions that are occurring and they're ultimately producing ATP. And I'm going to just draw it right here. Now, if you don't know what this system of um, proteins and enzymes are here, this is the citric acid cycle and it's got a lot of different enzymes. And these enzymes are going to be sequential in how they basically produce energy. And if you look to the right here, let me clean this up. If you look here, just like what we saw within glycolysis, we see the formation of these secondary or intermediate molecules that are part of secondary metabolism, right? So you can see here we have secondary metabolism. We have NADH2 being formed. Now this is in the citric acid cycle. And again, most of our ATP is created here specifically at rest. So energy production mostly takes place on the folds of on the inside of the, the, the membrane of the mitochondria. And the mitochondria is going to convert this chemical energy from food, the food that we eat, to an energy that the cell can use, okay? So again, glucose coming from, let's say grapes, glucose gets converted into this. This molecule undergoes conversions with all of these enzymes. In the meanwhile, we have secondary intermediates being made, secondary intermediates being made, and ultimately this glucose gets converted into ATP which is an energy source that the cell can use for everything that occurs in metabolism or any sort of cellular process whatsoever. Okay, so it's very interesting that this is how the conversion happens from food to cellular energy. And it's, it's, it's not much different than what we saw with transcription and translation. We have a genetic message being converted into a protein message, right? Which would be the, the assembly of proteins. And this here, we have glucose, we have this food system, food stuff that is converted to cellular energy. Um, now, let's see, what else can I tell you about this? Um, this entire process is called oxidative phosphorylation. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that or not yet, but we are going to talk about it. Right now, I'm just, I'm just introducing you to some components because if you look at this and you've never seen this before this is pretty intense and the krebs cycle or the citric acid cycle most importantly produces these chemicals called nadh and fadh2 and these uh these things these electron carriers they're used by other enzymes right we talked about enzymes and how they help create energy that are embedded in the mitochondria right here right? These proteins are acting as enzymes. They use this molecule to help generate ATP. And this is what will create that energy. 
okay? Um, some other things that we can see is that when we are resting, our blood lactate levels are very low, less than one point millimole per liter. Okay, when we exercise, when we start to move our body and we start to generate lactate, that burning in our legs, right? If we're running, that could move up to eight or nine millimoles per liter. Okay, so that's how quickly a shift in metabolism can change lactic acid or lactate, right? And when we're generally resting, we're consuming about 3.5 milliliters of oxygen per kilogram of body weight per minute. And when we exercise, that's going to skyrocket as well. All right. So the demand that we place on the body when we start to exercise is going to interact how these nutrients are mobilized, right? How glucose is mobilized, how quickly it goes through something like the citric acid cycle, how quickly it can generate these molecules right here, and how quickly this series of enzymes can turn all of this into ATP, right? So it's a very, very, very complex thing, which is why bioenergetics and metabolism is a very cool thing, okay? So when we're at rest, the takeaway message here is when we're at rest, we're producing most of our energy through the mitochondria by mobilizing and using fatty acids to help break down to create energy. Now, what we move, when we move into exercise, a couple of really cool things kind of happen here. Everything shifts, okay? When we transition into exercise, there is a change in energy needs and energy demands, okay? So the metabolism is completely going to change itself to create more ATP and to get more of that energy readily available. So high intensity exercise can result in a 1000 fold increase in the rate of ATP demand. All right. So that is a very, very robust response. And it depends on how intensely, intensely you are exercising. If you're doing high intensity HIIT training, this could be even more. If you're just doing, uh, you know, maybe a three mile run at a very slow pace, and it's, it's um, continuous exercise, it might be a little less, but there is a surge in demand of ATP, which means that all of these mechanisms that I'm showing you here and here, and let's go back here, here have to do their job faster in order to keep you within uh, that exercise regimen or, or that exercise that you're doing at the moment, okay? So ATP production will increase immediately. So what happens is we'll shift away from this mitochondria ATP production and we'll start using other systems that are more readily available and might give us energy a little quicker. Oxygen uptake increases rapidly as well. So we, we within one to four minutes of exercise, we will reach a new steady state of oxygen, right? Um, and that is going to be very different than the 3.5 milliliters that we consume at rest, right? I showed you that here. So we are going to reach a new steady state of oxygen at rest. This is our steady state. But when we exercise, there's a greater demand. Therefore, that's going to rise. Um, and then after steady state is reached, ATP requirement is met through aerobic ATP production. Okay, so... This is where exercise metabolism gets a little tricky. So if we are exercising aerobically, and let's say we're going to do a five mile run, we have about one to four minutes. If you guys are out of shape, it's going to be four minutes. If you guys are in great shape, it might be closer to one minute, but you have that time frame in where ATP has to come from a different source than where it's coming from during rest. And this is where we get into other energy systems. And we will talk about these energy systems in a little bit. I'm just introducing the concepts to you, okay? So, and then once a steady state is reached, and it means that we are consuming as much oxygen as we're going to consume for that intensity of exercise, then we will go back to aerobic ATP production and the mitochondrial will produce more of uh, the ATP. 
So what happens when we're doing high intensity training and we don't really get into that aerobic zone and we're not really using the mitochondria as much as we could be? Well, then we have to rely on ATP coming from other sources. And one of those sources could be, let's just kind of go back to this, glycolysis. We know that glycolysis is producing ATP. So we could get some of that energy just by bringing sugar into the cell and metabolizing that for energy there. So that's just giving you one example. Um, the initial ATP production is going to be done through something called the ATP PC system. Okay. And then we're going to move to glycolysis. Um, and I'm going to draw these, uh, these pathways for you in a moment here, because some of you guys may not have seen this. Some of you guys might have seen this a thousand times, but now we're just piecing together what's happening in the cell with the demand of energy. And then oxygen deficit basically means that when we are doing this exercise here, and there's one to four minutes before the mitochondria truly starts producing energy after we start exercising, we call this an oxygen deficit, which means there's a lag in oxygen uptake at the beginning of exercise, and we have to pay for ATP through other systems. And one of those systems might be glycolysis. The other system might be the ATP phosphocreatine system. If you don't know what this is, I'm going to draw it for you and it all makes sense. Okay. So we go from a system of rest where we're metabolizing mostly fatty acids to produce ATP in the mitochondria oxidatively. When we begin to exercise, we leave that oxidative state and we have to basically rely on other systems such as glycolysis and ATP until this lag in oxygen uptake catches up and then we can start to use oxygen once more. And on the last slide here, before I go into the drawing, we're, we're still talking about the transition from exercise, from rest to exercise. Um, and some important things to know is that to sustain muscle contraction, the ATP needs, ATP needs to be regenerated at the rate complementary to ATP demand. So if we are, if we have um, ATB, ATP being consumed very quickly because we're exercising very intensely, then that means we need enzymes and we need a system of enzymes or a sequential cluster of enzymes producing ATP just as quickly. If not, you will experience fatigue. You will not be able to run anymore. You will not be able to jump. You will not be able to sprint. Your legs will feel very heavy. Your muscles will feel very exhausted. Okay. And I'm going to draw this for you guys. And many of you guys probably know this already, but we have three energy systems to help us keep that demand, that ATP uh, production to meet the demands of ATP utilization, right? So if we had, let me just draw for you guys for a moment here. Let's say I had a, I had a graph, right? And let's say that ATP use went like this. We're doing high intensity exercise and ATP plummets because we're not producing ATP fast enough. So let's say we are using these energy systems to produce ATP and the ATP meets here and then it flattens out because we're producing it at a rate that is continuous, which means that ATP in this case would come here and then flatten out as well because we are producing it as quickly as we're using it. So that line would disappear because we have systems in place to produce this energy at the same rate in which we are using this energy. Okay. And we're going to use three systems to maintain that. One is going to be the phosphagen system. The other is going to be the glycolytic system in which there are two pieces to this. There is fast glycolysis and slow glycolysis, or we could say anaerobic glycolysis and aerobic glycolysis. And then we're going to have the mitochondrial respiration, which is beta oxidation, which is um, oxidative phosphorylation. It's all the same thing. 
Um, but the locations of these energy systems are going to be in three different places, right? So this third one here, that's going to be the mitochondria. This is going to be using the electron transport chain and the citric acid cycle, where the phosphagen system is going to be in the cytosol of the, of the cell, and so is glycolysis. That's going to be in the cytosol of the cell as well. So these systems, they use different substrates as well to produce ATP. Generally, generally, the mitochondria is going to use fatty acids, right? But it can also use some glucose if the intensity of the workout is low enough. Glycolysis, obviously, that's going to use glucose, sugar, and ATP is going to use phosphagen and creatine phosphate, or just creatine phosphate. This is a phosphogenic system. And what that means is that when creatine phosphate is being used, there's going to be a lot of free phosphate in the cell. And I, I'll draw all this for you guys, so you guys don't need to sweat this too much. Um, in this context, fatigue is best defined as a decrease in force production during muscle contraction. And this decrease in force production is coming from a decrease in ATP. If we're not producing it fast enough, we cannot keep the same intensity up. Okay, so I'm going to stop there and I'm going to draw you a picture and hopefully this will all make much more sense in a moment. Okay, guys, um, I wanted to kind of save this drawing for the later part of the lecture. Just in case you know this, you can kind of just fast forward and not really pay attention here. But uh, when I do look at the class schedule, we have some sophomores, we have some juniors, we have some seniors. Uh, so not everyone is familiar with the location of these energy sources or how energy uh, is used in the cell. So I, I just kind of want to go over it a little bit and make sure that everybody is up to speed and up to par. So I just kind of want to look at the skeletal muscle first. So um, you should all be familiar with what a skeletal muscle looks like. And I kind of drew this skeletal muscle uh, long. We're looking at a long view of a myofiber, right? And we can see that there's several nuclei, right? Here's one, right? Two and three. So we know skeletal muscle is multinucleated. You should be familiar with this. And then in here, I created the cellular environment so I can show you where some of these reactions are taking place so you have a better understanding for this overview of metabolism. So first things first, let's pick a good color here for ATP, okay? We all have an ATP pool in our cell, right? And I'm just gonna, let's just draw a little swimming pool, right? Just to make the visually, you guys know that we have a pool of this stuff. Here's the water, right? And we have a pool of ATP in the cell ready to go, ready to be utilized. Um, and we don't have much of it. We have about 10 seconds worth of it, or maybe even less. Now, when we're at rest and we're not exercising, the mitochondria, which is here, I drew that for you just in case you've never seen a mitochondria, it is generating most of the ATP for uh, just basal function at rest, right? So if you're sitting there studying, what's keeping you alive, what's helping you write your, you know, use your pencil to take notes, what's helping your eyes move so that you can look at your tablet and read your instructor notes, it's ATP, and that ATP at rest is coming from the mitochondria. And we kind of talked about that uh, in the lecture slide, right? I, I did inform you that, in fact, um, almost 100% of ATP produced uh, at rest is by the aerobic metabolism system. So that is what is happening in the mitochondria. And then let's say we begin to exercise. Well, this ATP pool gets converted into ADP and AMP very quickly because we're using ATP, so we're having a catabolic reaction. And once we get to ADP and AMP in the cell, that starts to send off signals to start using other substrates. Well, one of those substrates that we're going to use is glycolysis. We're going to use sugar. Now, 
also inside of the muscle cell, we have a polymer storage of sugar, right? So here is one glucose molecule, right? And here is two glucose molecules and three, and four, and five, and six, and seven, eight, nine, ten, up to up to let's say thirty thousand, right? And this represents glycogen, right? And glycogen is a polymer of glucose. So we have one, one little glucose molecule that essentially polymerizes and makes this very complex structure of glycogen. Well, that's also in the cell. So we have in the cell, we have readily available ATP to be used. And then when we have to shift to another metabolic pathway, which would be glycolysis, and I have this here for you, right? Glycolysis, it's written right there. We can start pulling sugar into glycolysis that we have obtained the night before through diet, right? So if we eat a carbohydrate rich meal, uh, the night before we exercise, actually you want to eat it two nights because it takes about 48 to 72 hours to completely uh, saturate skeletal muscle with glycogen. Well, we can do that through diet, right? And we can take that glucose and we can make this very complex structure of glucose molecules that is a polymer and that's ready to be used as energy. So we also have glycogen in the muscle which is a complex version of glucose, right? And what happens is we have these enzymes that come in and start chopping up, chopping up this molecule and we start secreting glucose into glycolysis, all right? So we have that there. Now, let me clean this up a little bit because I'm gonna keep drawing. Now, we also have something called ATPPC, which is phosphocreatine. You guys may know this, you may not know this. It depends on where you are in your education, right? So ATPPC. This PC is called phosphocreatine. And what phosphocreatine does, I'm just gonna give you a really generic representation of it here. We have P and C. So what phosphocreatine does is we have something called creatine kinase which will separate these two and essentially put a phosphate back on ADP to turn it into ATP, okay? So it is resynthesizing ATP. Now this whole system here lasts roughly about 10 to 15 seconds, okay? So 10 to 15 seconds. And that is happening in the cytosol of the cell, right? So this, this mechanism here, this ATPPC, it helps take ADP and turn it back into ATP. So it's helping resynthesize ATP for a very short amount of time. Once we are using more ATP than we can resynthesize through this mechanism here, so if we're exercising intensely, and we're not taking a break and the demand for ATP is too high for this mechanism to keep up, well then what happens is we shift into a glycolytic state where we use these sugars and we mobilize sugars to start metabolizing for more ATP. So let me clean this up, let me get rid of this and I'm gonna just, I'm gonna put a placeholder in there for a moment and just say in the cytosol of the skeletal muscle cell we have a system called ATPPC, which lasts about 10 to 15 seconds once we begin to exercise. And basically this PC helps put a phosphate back on ADP, okay? So we take a phosphate, we add it to that, and then we have ATP again. So this, this ATP PC system is very short in duration and we could resynthesize ATP for about 10 to 15 seconds. And if exercise intensity is very, very high, well, that's going to be even less. That 10 to 15 seconds might be seven seconds, okay? So it truly, truly depends on, um, it truly depends on intensity. Now, let me clean this side up, okay? 
we can have, I'm going to draw glycogen how it really looks, okay? Glycogen looks like this, and then it looks like a spider web, right? And that spider web is all the glycogen or the glucose polymer chains that are tied together with certain types of bonds, very similar to nucleic acids, which we've talked about. And once exercise moves into, let's say, 15 to 30 seconds, we start to send these glucose molecules into glycolysis. And what is glycolysis? Well, if you look back to your slides, we talked about this quite a bit. Glycolysis is a sequential enzyme system that is going to start generating ATP. Okay. Now we have two types of glycolysis. We have fast glycolysis and we have slow glycolysis. So if we are exercising intensely and we begin, we begin to feel burning in our legs or in our arms or burning throughout the body, that tells us that we are generating something called lactate. And not only lactate, but also hydrogen. And the hydrogen, this is what's causing the burning. Okay. But when we feel that burning, we know that the energy that we are generating is basically anaerobic. And anaerobic is fast burning glycolysis. Okay. So we're not even using oxygen yet. How do we know we're not using oxygen? Because look at, I'm not even in the mitochondria. The mitochondria is using oxygen. All of these reactions are occurring in the cytosol of the cell. They're not even happening in the mitochondria. So if we have that burning, well, then we know that the, the glycolysis and the glucose that we're metabolizing in the cytosol is starting to generate lactate and hydrogen. Sorry, let me fix this. And we know that that is happening in the cytosol of the cell as well. Okay. So we have two reactions in the cytosol right now. We have the ATPPC right there, and we have fast glycolysis and that's happening. Now let's say we slow down our intensity and we're not running very fast anymore. Let's say we start to slow the intensity down. Well, when the intensity of exercise begins to slow down, we are going to shift from fast glycolysis. So let me get rid of this. We're not even going to, we're not even going to be over here anymore making lactate. We're going to shift from fast, fast glycolysis to slow glycolysis. So then what happens is those glucose molecules and these glucose mo molecules, they change shape through glycolysis. And we'll talk about that. Essentially what happens is they turn into something called pyruvate. Okay. And pyruvate can either be converted into lactate if we're exercising intensely, or if we slow down that intense exercise, that pyruvate can go into the mitochondria. And then we can start using oxygen to metabolize pyruvate to make ATP. So what that process is, is something called slow glycolysis. All right. So glucose can either be metabolized anaerobically, where it turns into lactate, or aerobically, where it enters the mitochondria, right? Now, if we look at the mitochondria and we zoom in, that's what this window is here, right? It's zooming in. We can see that that pyruvate will enter the mitochondria and it will enter something called the citric acid cycle, which I've already talked about with you guys. And in the citric acid cycle, we'll start making some of that NADH and we'll start making some of that FADH2. And we call that secondary metabolism, right? And that's also happening here. We're forming NADH. And these in glycolysis and in the citric acid cycle are going to move to the electron transport chain to the electron transport chain. You can see I have that right here. Here are the proteins in the electron transport chain. And if you don't know what these proteins are, I'm just introducing it right now. And essentially what's going to happen is all of this is going to convert ADP into ATP, right? So 
these are the three pathways and that third one would be aerobic system or beta oxidation and that's right here in the mitochondria. Now the other thing that could happen is if intensity slows down we can have fatty acids. I'm going to draw this right here. This is a fatty acid, right? And fatty acids need a transporter to get into the cell. They can't just get in by themselves. So we're going to call this the transporter. And right now you don't need to know the name. We're just introducing the concepts. Fatty acids can also enter into the skeletal muscle and they can enter into the mitochondria right here, enter into the Krebs cycle or the citric acid cycle and start making ATP. So interestingly, fatty acids don't have to just come from fat uh, fat stores or adipose tissues we can just like glycogen we can store some fatty acids in the muscle right so i'm going to draw that here and fatty acids in the muscle can be used to enter the mitochondria enter the citric acid cycle or the tca cycle they will produce these electron carriers that we already talked about and then we will start producing a lot of ATP with fatty acids. So this is kind of an overview, just showing you where all these things are in the cell. Okay. Now we can also bring in glucose from the blood. Let's say you are fasting, right? Let's say you just, you haven't been eating because somebody said that alternative day fasting or long fasting is good for exercise. Well, guess what? It's not good for exercise because if you're fasting, look what happens this all goes away. We lose muscle glycogen, right? Muscle glycogen is gone. So then if you want to bring in sugar while you're exercising, well, that sugar is going to have to come either from the liver or from the blood, right? So the sugar would be out here. It will enter the skeletal muscle cell from the blood and it will start undergoing glycolysis. Now that is a slower process. It takes more energy to bring it in from the blood than if we just had glycogen sitting right here, right? Okay, so that is a hard and fast sort of introduction to where these things are happening in the cell. Now let's look at how this metabolism works uh, on the next slide. Okay, so uh, on this slide, I want to go through these different metabolic pathways, right? And we're, we're essentially talking about pathways here. We're talking about the different pathways that will generate energy once we leave rest. And remember, I told you when we are resting, almost 100%, and it's almost, it's not 100%. You know what? Let me just, let me clean that up so I don't confuse anyone. I'm going to just say 85% of ATP comes from the mitochondria at rest, right? And we have mitochondria in most of our skeletal muscle cells, right? And then I said, when we shift away from rest and we begin to exercise, the demand for ATP skyrockets, right? There's a massive surge in the need for ATP. And the mitochondria can't keep up with that ATP right away. We can get there eventually. The mitochondria can catch up. But remember, I said once we start to exercise, there's an O2 deficit, which means we have to bring in enough oxygen to make ATP when we're exercising. Because when we're resting, we have about 3.5 ml of O2 per kilogram of body weight. And then when we exercise, depending on what type of exercise we do, there's a massive demand in oxygen as well. But it takes a little while for us to get to that oxygen to start making very robust levels of ATP. So let's start with our first metabolic pathway. And I'm going to use green because that's the color I used on the last, the last image, right? So if we go back to this one, I talked about this ATP PC system. And again, if you've seen this, it's okay. See it again. If you, if you, uh, have never seen this before, this is going to be super, super important for exercise physiology and bioenergetics as you move further into our program. So let's start with the swimming pool. Okay. Here's the swimming pool. Here's the little, the water in the swimming pool, right? Green water. It's St. Patrick's day. 
I told you that we have a certain amount of ATP in our cells, a little baby kitty swimming pool worth, okay? And that ATP will last about 10 seconds and then it will plummet, right? And if we're exercising very intensely, it might look something like this, okay? It will we'll have even less of it, okay? So just for the sake of not confusing you, and just in case you haven't seen this before, let's start again. We'll say that we have generically about 10 seconds of ATP. Now that's the pool. I also told you we have this system called ATPPC. And this is some this is a molecule called phosphocreatine, creatine and phosphate. And this molecule is willing to give up a phosphate to help turn a DP, which is low energy, into ATP. And it uses an enzyme called creatine kinase, right? Creatine kinase, I'm just going to put CK, makes this reaction happen. So what creatine kinase does with the phosphocreatine system is once we get here, okay, that means that there is a lot of ADP and a lot of AMP floating around in the cell. And whenever we have ADP, which is adenosine diphosphate or adenosine monophosphate, what those two molecules mean is low energy in the cell. And when there's low energy in the cell, we have to wake up the PC system to come and help us. So the PC system will start, it will activate, it will raise, look at this, ATP levels high and then it will crash because we only have a few seconds of ATP PC and basically those two systems combined will give us generically about 15 seconds worth of energy okay and that is all anaerobic there's no oxygen um, and the reason this ATP level rises again is because this system is putting all of those phosphates back onto ADP to make ATP, okay? So let me clean this up because I'm gonna draw some more stuff on here, okay? Clean this up, okay? We know that this crossover right here where these two systems meet is a result of lots of AMP and lots of ADP. Now, if you don't know what AMP and ADP are, let me just quickly draw that for you so you have a better idea. And I would assume if you're sophomores, you've, you've come across this. But let me just be as thorough as I can and make sure we're doing everything we can do to make you guys understand this. So when we have ATP, we have adenosine and three phosphates, right? And every time we use ATP as energy we essentially cleave a phosphate, right? So if we're doing muscle contraction, we'll cleave this phosphate, and what are we left with? A, D, P, okay? And adenosine diphosphate, because there's only two, right? And then let's say we're exercising really intense, intensely, and we cleave this phosphate, then what are we left with? We're left with adenosine and one phosphate, which is adenosine monophosphate. And ADP and AMP tell the cellular environment that energy is low. The, the skeletal muscle cells don't like AMP and ADP. They like ATP. And they're going to do everything they can to keep those ATP levels as high as they can. Okay, so let's go back. Let me clean this up as well. Okay, And I'm not too worried about all these mechanisms because I'm just giving you an overview right now. And you will come across more of these in exercise phys. You'll come across it in exercise um, 460A and 460B. So you'll see this over and over and over again. Okay, so the next one I talked to you guys about is, let me go back. We talked about glycolysis, right, right there. And we talked about both glycogen and glucose coming from the blood that will enter the glycolytic pathway, which is glycolysis, right? And I told you that there is a fast and a slow. So 
let's go back to our energy pathway drawing. So once, let's pick a different color here. Let's do purple. Once this ATP can no longer be sustained, right? Right here, we have a lot of ATP. And then once this starts to drop like this, that means we got a lot of ADP. And if it continues to fall, we have a lot of AMP, right? And then when we get down here, we have only AMP and then we're, we're, we're in bad shape, all right? So when the cell recognizes that ADP and AMP are both high in the cellular environment, in the muscle cell, well, it's going to start to mobilize sugar and that's gonna look like this. So we'll have, we'll have uh, like right there, we'll have some sugar start to come in like this. It will come to the rescue and rise, right? Here we have high levels of ATP thanks to sugar and then it's gonna plummet, okay? And this purple one is what is going to generate lactate and hydrogen ions, which is what's gonna cause the burning in the legs. This fast glycolysis is anaerobic. We have no oxygen, okay? So first pathway, no oxygen. Second pathway, no oxygen. Third pathway, no oxygen. Okay, hope that makes sense. I'm gonna clean this up now. Okay. Um, and I, I, similar to the other, similar to the other pathways. Once we get over this crest, we have a lot of ATP, right? Cause that's what this is showing. So watch, if I go over here like this, follow my dotted line, right? It's almost the same amount of ATP that we started with. And that's what these systems are trying to do. They're trying to start, they're trying to give you the same amount of ATP than we started with, right? So if this were 2000 calories of ATP, these systems are gonna try to get 2000 calories every time you're trying to exercise, which means it's trying to make a lot of ATP so you can continue to exercise and there's not a deficit in ATP levels, okay? So let me clean this up because it drives me nuts when I have all this filth on there. Okay, so here we have that ATP, right? And we know that it's very high, just like how we started. And then it's gonna drop. So then we get ADP, if it continues to drop, AMP, right? And these two signals are going to tell the cell to mobilize another energy system. So then, let's pick blue, we will mobilize sugar in an aerobic capacity. And that's gonna go like this and drop again. And look where we are with time frames, right? Aerobic glycolysis, we can use for about 30 to 60 seconds. Anaerobic glycolysis could be anywhere between 15 and 30 seconds. You see that there? Okay, and then basically this is where I was showing you where glucose is going to, let me go back here. Oops, sorry, wrong one. Glucose is going to start moving right here into the mitochondria. Now, if the glucose is moving into the mitochondria, right, shh, that means that intensity has to slow down. We won't be able to work as hard because now we're moving into an aerobic capacity, right? So this slow, I'm just gonna put slow G for glycolysis. This is where the sugar is going into the mitochondria to create ATP, right? Now, under all of that, we have fatty acids that are also helping with energy and fatty acids are going to take over right here when that system crashes, okay? So when we have high levels of ATP and then we get ADP and then right here when we get AMP, we have fatty acids that are there and fatty acids, we can go from 90 seconds to three hours, right? We have a tremendous amount of energy when we use fatty acids in metabolism. But these are how those systems work. And they have, they have time frames in which they exist in, right? So if we look at the ATP PC system, right? That's about, here, I'll just say about 10 to 15 seconds, right? Shoo -shoo. So from the onset of exercise to about 15 seconds, ATP, PC. 
And then we'll start to mobilize anaerobic glycolysis. And that would be from 15 seconds to about 30 seconds. These are generic numbers. So 15 seconds to 30 seconds. And then we'll mobilize more sugar from, uh, but we'll decrease the intensity. And then we'll have slow glycolysis, which, is, which could be 60 to 90 seconds. And then once we have fatty acids coming in, that's from 90 seconds to three hours or 90 seconds to four hours, right? So those are the energy pathways. All right. I just want to go over one more slide here um, just to kind of tie some pieces together. Um, so when I had mentioned, when I was talking about this picture here and we were talking about where these energy systems exist, well, I wanted to demonstrate that the liver, okay, is a major hub for holding glycogen. All right, so within, let me pick the glycogen color, sorry, I'm gonna, here we go. Within the liver, we store a, oh, that's a little too big, let me make this smaller. We store a lot of this glycogen polymer, right? And again, glycogen is just these polymers of glucose that are bound together with certain bonds. And when we need energy, these glucose molecules are cleaved and they are secreted into the blood. Okay. And then they get into the blood. Let me draw a picture of, uh, oh my goodness. That's not what I wanted. Let me go back. Here we go. It's just a hot mess over here. <laughs> um, so let me draw a picture of, uh, come on, gets into the blood. All right. So here's the bloodstream. All right. Glucose will get in and it will be delivered to whatever tissue needs it. Right. And generally that tissue could be skeletal muscle. Um, so glu glucose, I'm sorry, the liver can hold about 200 to 400 kilocalories of glycogen. All right. It's not a lot. It, it, it's the, the glycogen that comes from the liver predominantly is going to feed the brain while you are sleeping, right? That's what keeps your brain alive and keeps sugar going to the brain. Um, but when we do have a demand for exercise and we need glucose to be mobilized, and when would we need glucose to be mobilized? Well, let's just tie it together here, right? Here's that ATP, right? And this is time. Well, if we, um, if we blow through that pool of ATP within the first 10 seconds, and then we start to, oh my goodness, what are you doing? Okay. Then we start to use that ATP PC system. Well, right here is when we start mobilizing glucose. So we might have some glucose from the liver start to be secreted to help skeletal muscle produce ATP. Okay. So if we have the glucose that's being dumped into the blood, it goes to skeletal muscle. It gets inside the skeletal muscle. It undergoes glycolysis. I'm just going to put GLY and then we get some ATP. Okay. We get some ATP being produced. All right. Now that's one of the, th that's one of the systems that will give glucose to the working muscle. Now I told you earlier in the lecture that this process is regulated by hormones. So what hormones are going to tell the liver to start secreting glucose and breaking down this glycogen? Well, we're going to have glucagon, right? Glucagon is a hormone that comes from the pancreas. We are going to have, uh, epi and norepinephrine. We're going to have cortisol, right? We're going to have um, these things circulating, which is going to tell gl uh, glycogen in the liver to start to be broken down. Okay. Now I also told you, let me go back to my glycogen color. I also told you that muscle holds glycogen. I'm going to draw this spider web over here, right? Okay. Muscle holds this complex structure 
of glycogen. And muscle glycogen is about 1,000 to 3,000 kcals or calories of potential energy that is in the muscle. So if the skeletal muscle is working, we could have glucose that is mobilized from glycogen, enters glycolysis, and then we start producing some ATP that way, right? And we know that this glycogen could be used either quickly in the fast glycolysis or slowly in the slow glycolysis, and it depends on intensity. High intensity is going to be fast glycolysis, and we're going to have lactate and hydrogen ions. Slow glycolysis is going to be lower intensity, and that is going to be sugar that enters the mitochondria to make ATP. Now, also athletes, let me get another picture here, athletes hold fat inside their skeletal muscles, right? So here's the fatty acids. And if we saturate the skeletal muscle with fatty acids, we could have anywhere between 2,000 to 3,000 kcals of fatty acids that can produce ATP. And that ATP, of course, is going to happen in the mitochondria. It's going to use the citric acid cycle and the electron transport chain. And that's going to create ATP there. Okay. Um, now we know that, let me get, let me get the glucose color. Glucose can go to the muscle to be metabolized and the muscle can send lactate back to the liver to be converted to glucose. And then the liver could send out that glucose to the working muscle, right? So this would be say, let's just say glucose from lactate. Okay. Does that make sense? So now if we have this glycolysis here, that is going into the mitochondria because intensity is low. Well, then we're going to have this be in our primary system. Okay. And we know that that is slow glycolysis. I'm just going to put slow G. And if we're using fatty acids to move into the mitochondria to start producing ATP, we know that the intensity is going to be very low because fatty acids like to, they like to be mobilized when there's low intensity and there's oxygen. And that's going to look like this. And we know that one can just kind of keep going because I mean, we, if we have 2000 to 3000 kcals in skeletal muscle, and if we look over here at adipose tissue and adipose tissue has 50,000 to 1000, 100,000 kcals, that means the fatty acids from the muscle and the fatty acids from the adipose tissue, which is your, your fat around your tummy, uh, that provides a tremendous amount of energy. Now, not only can fatty acids in the muscle enter the mitochondria. Let me, let me draw a mitochondria here. Let me just draw another one. Draw it right here. There's the mitochondria and we'll make it like that. Okay. Make it a little thicker for you. Not only could the fatty acids and the glucose, glucose, fatty acids enter the mitochondria to make ATP, but fatty acids can also be mobilized from the fat cells and they can just like the glucose, enter the bloodstream. Okay. There's the bloodstream and they can be mobilized into the blood as fatty acids. They can enter skeletal muscle and they can be metabolized by the mitochondria as well to produce ATP. So what's important to understand here, the big takeaway is that the liver will mobilize glucose from glycogen and send it to the working tissue to help with ATP. Glucose within the muscle cell that is bound within these glycogen polymers can also be mobilized to create ATP in the cell. Fatty acids in the skeletal muscle could also be mobilized within the mitochondria to create ATP. 
and fatty acids from fat tissue can be mobilized. So this is where that energy, this is where those substrates are coming from. The substrates are going to be one, fatty acids, okay, two, glucose, and enzymes are going to act on these to make either ATP or to make ATP and NADH and FADH2. And the electron carriers are going to make energy in the mitochondria where these molecules, these ATP molecules, can be they can be metabolized in the muscle without without um, entering the mitochondria. Okay, so this is just showing you where these things are coming from. Um, and then one last thing is when we're talking about the fat inside of skeletal muscle, and if you guys if you guys are like, well, I never knew there was fat inside of skeletal muscle. Well, you have. Um, let me just. Let me draw it for you, right? So let's just say you have this beautiful steak, right? And that steak, right? That steak has that fat around it, right? And if you watch any chef on, um, if you watch any chef on the Food Network, they said, okay, don't take that fat off. Let that fat cook with the steak so it keeps the steak moist, right? And then you, you see all these, these uh, let's just put a bone here. It's a, let's just say that's, what, that's that bone inside of the steak and then here's the bone marrow, right? Um, well, you guys uh, that eat steak, you pay a premium on something called marbling, right? So when you eat a steak, um, you have this marbling in there, right? And the more marbling you have, the more expensive the steak is because you're like, oh, look at all that. Look at all that fat inside of the steak. Look at all that marbling. Well, that marbling is something called IMT, intramuscular triglycerides, which is essentially fat, right? And the more marbling that they have in the steak, the more fat the animal is storing in the muscle. Now, with athletes, we want to store fat in the muscle because we're going to use it. That muscle is a storage unit, right? So let's let's get away from animal animal steaks and let's look at skeletal muscle. All right here's human skeletal muscle, which is essentially steak. Um, right there's our bone. Right there's our bone. Uh, when we have a lot of mitochondria. In our skeletal muscle. We know that when we exercise a lot in an aerobic capacity, we increase our mitochondria density, which means we get more of them, right? It just goes up and goes up and goes up. Well, if we have these machines in the muscle to metabolize fatty acids and to metabolize sugar and to create energy, it's a really good idea to store fatty acids in the muscle so that when there is exercise or a demand of exercise, these fatty acids can go into all these mitochondria to start creating ATP. And the more mitochondria, the faster we create ATP and the longer and the more intensely we can exercise. Okay. So, um, we can store this fat and we can store this glycogen in skeletal muscle so that we have this immediate energy to burn through right here's the glycogen that's the sugar we have this immediate energy to use before or while the liver and the fat cells are starting to send things through the circulation not to help the muscle right the liver is going to be sending glucose and the fat's going to be sending fatty acids. And by the time they get here, we might have depleted some of these fatty acids and we might have depleted some of this glucose or this glycogen. So we want to be able to store some of these macronutrients, these polymers, uh, in our skeletal muscle so that we have immediate energy to create ATP 
while we're waiting for the cavalry to show up and provide us with more energy. All right, so that's all I have for you guys right now. I will upload another video very soon. Take care and make sure you take wonderful notes.